Welcome to my uh, class uh, on the Dutch at Waterloo. Uh, my name is uh, Ben Schoemaker. Uh, I am a professor of military history at the University of uh, Leiden. I'm also a director of the uh, Netherlands Institute of uh, Military History in, uh, in The Hague. And uh, what I'd like to do is to present you a short class on the uh, Dutch role, the Dutch contribution to the uh, Battle of uh, Waterloo in 1815. Uh, in um, 2015, which was the year of the uh, bicentennial, together with uh, two colleagues, I published a book on the uh, on the Battle of Waterloo uh, in Dutch, uh, focusing on the uh, on the Dutch uh, role, which had been up to that time rather under uh, understudied. And um, we uh, give the book a, a subtitle in, in Dutch. It reads 200 Jahr Strijd, uh, translated uh, into a 200 year struggle. Uh, because in the book, we also uh, devote a lot of attention to, let's say, the historiographical debate uh, on, the battle, on the Battle of Waterloo, again, focusing on the Dutch role, the Dutch perspective, what Dutch historians have written on uh, this particular battle, uh, which is, in a sense, a, you could say a refreshing uh, perspective because uh, in historiography, um, the, the British perspective, the British view has, has always been very dominant. Uh, you could say that the Brits, uh, British historians basically claimed the battle, claimed the victory as being a, a British victory, and uh, of course there were allies uh, present, but it was primarily the, the British view and the, the British role that was uh, dominant. Uh, also, you could say in, in, in collective memory, um, uh, Waterloo has played a very important role, particularly in, in British history. Uh, uh, many objects, uh, many towns, but also, for instance, here Waterloo Bridge, in, in London, named after the battle, uh, and Waterloo, fortunately, a name that could also be pronounced very easily in English. Um, the Battle of Waterloo, uh, together with the naval battle of, of Trafalgar uh, 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 10 years earlier, basically also played such an important role in British history because those two battles, you could call them twin battles, uh, kind of heralded the uh, the golden years, the golden age of the British Empire, the 19th century, in which uh, uh, Britain evolved into, let's say, the dominant uh, global power, uh, a period that lasted until, well, would be First World War. Uh, some Brexiteers still think that uh, that period is not yet over, uh, uh, but that is, of course, their very uh, uh, private view. Uh, so Waterloo as a British battle. Um, now you probably know that the British army that fought at Waterloo, if you look at the way it was, uh, its composition, it was very much a multinational force with uh, large, particularly large German contingents uh, fighting under the command of, um, of Wellington. And uh, so it comes as no surprise that, for instance, in the city of Hanover, uh, there's also a, uh, a, a memorial uh, devoted to uh, the Battle of Waterloo, uh, a column uh, um, erected uh, between 1825 and 1832, uh, remembering the, uh, the German soldiers that had fought under, under Wellington at uh, Waterloo. And, um, an interesting book uh, um, uh, came out in the year 1999 uh, by a uh, originally a German uh, historian, uh, Peter Hofschreuer, who basically said, you know, the Waterloo campaign, we should really see it not so much as a British victory, but as a, uh, a, a German uh, victory, a bit provocative. Uh, but he said, you know, because the, the British army had so many uh, German nationals uh, within its rank, we should actually see it as a German victory in disguise. And also uh, because the Prussian army, which came rather late to the battlefield uh, on 
18th of June 1815, the, the Prussian army, uh, which appeared on uh, Wellington's uh, uh, left flank again in the afternoon of the battle, uh, basically was decisive in uh, eventually defeating uh, Napoleon. So without the aid of the Prussians, uh, Wellington would not have been victorious. Well, the debate still goes on in that respect. Um, but what about the Dutch? Uh, where are they in the picture? Uh, well, um, our claim is that, um, yes, the Dutch and the Dutch uh, involvement, the Dutch contribution should definitely be in the, in the picture. Uh, first of all, because we have to uh, take into account that the battle itself took place on Dutch soil. Uh, or to be a little bit more precise, it took place uh, uh, on the territory of the newly established uh, uh, Kingdom of the Netherlands, which was a, a new construction, if you like, as a result of the Congress of uh, Vienna uh, to kind of merge the, uh, the Northern Netherlands and the Southern Netherlands into one hopefully strong state, uh, which was to serve as a as a bulwark against uh, possible future French aggression, because you know one of the the main questions in Vienna was how can we make sure that France uh, doesn't uh, give us uh, a trouble again in the uh, in the future. So this this bulwark idea under uh, the House of Orange, so the the, the House of Orange. Uh, was going to play an important role. Uh, the first king, King William I, was uh, a member of the House of Orange. Uh, that kingdom of the Netherlands was was given, you could say, a European task, a European role of containing uh, France. And, um, well, you could say that much earlier than expected, uh, the, this kingdom, this newly established kingdom, had actually to play this role as bulwark. Uh, and this has everything to do, of course, with the uh, return of Napoleon uh, to France, uh, escaping from uh, from Elba in the uh, in the spring of 1815, and trying to re-establish his uh, his empire. Uh, of course, Napoleon came from Elba with very peaceful uh, intent, but the. Uh, all the other powers in Europe did uh, not trust him, and uh, a sixth coalition uh, was formed to uh, to get rid of Napoleon, and this time uh, for good. And again, uh, the the Netherlands, uh, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, had to play an important role, and that role became uh, very important because Napoleon was also uh, going to uh, up north. Um, with his army to uh, to try to um, defeat his uh, opponents there first, and then he would, uh, if that would be successful, he would still have to deal with other armies, Austrian and Russian armies, that were also on their way uh, to France. Um, so what we see happening in uh, basically April, uh, May uh, 1815, is that uh, two large armies uh, come together in the Southern Netherlands. Um, um, and I have a map here. I, I have to say the maps are, uh, are in Dutch, but they are still quite legible, I think. And uh, in, in the blue, uh, you see the army, which is a, a mixed army of uh, of the British army and and the Dutch army. So the Anglo Dutch forces under uh, eventually the command of uh, the Duke of Wellington. And in um, in black, you see um, uh, the Prussian army uh, uh, under uh, Field Marshal Blücher. And those two armies were supposed to uh, um, stave off any attacks um, by the uh, the French army that we already see maneuvering uh, uh, um, on the um, Dutch uh, France French uh, border here. Um, the Dutch army uh, was, of course, a new army because the kingdom was new, so it had to be uh, built up uh, very quickly. 
Um, if you try to assess that army, um, one has to say that it was a mixture of very experienced uh, troops and very fresh and uh, not so experienced troops. Um, especially the officers and many of the NCOs, the non-commissioned officers uh, in the Dutch army, uh, they had a long experience uh, as members, as um, a part of the uh, Grand Armée. So they fought on Napoleon's side uh, for many, many years. So they were actually uh, quite uh, um, uh, experienced, as I said, and they had uh, now uh, uh, shifted their loyalty from Napoleon to uh, the House of uh, House of Orange. Must say that Wellington himself did sometimes doubt the loyalties of all those officers uh, that had fought on Napoleon's side for such a long time, but he was not going to be really disappointed in their behavior, in their loyalty, because they served their new king um, uh, quite well. Uh, the Dutch army also uh, had a lot of uh, conscripts uh, within his rank. Uh, we call them militia or militia men. And they were uh, not so experienced. They basically had been called up uh, a couple of months uh, uh, before the battle would actually take place. They had a very, almost a crash course uh, training. And so there was definitely, and rightfully so, some doubt about their military um, value. Um, Okay, well, uh, the Dutch army, uh, the Dutch contingent uh, within the larger uh, uh, Anglo-Dutch force, that Dutch contingent was led, was commanded by the Prince of Orange. Uh, uh, naturally, of course, the prince, uh, the highest ranking aristocrat had to be commander in chief. There was basically no discussion about that. Uh, uh, he was the son of uh, of King William I, and uh, actually he's going to play an important role, so I'm going to uh, mention his name uh, a few times. Uh, the Prince of Orange uh, had had some experience uh, fighting on Wellington's side in Spain, and, and so Wellington had gotten to know uh, um, this Prince of Orange pretty well, and his opinion of this young prince was that he was very brave, uh, but not very smart. Uh, so he had to take um, tight control over him. Uh, hopefully he would not uh, act uh, too foolishly. Um, well, uh, I think, you know, when you talk about the Dutch contribution, uh, it's, it's always good not to talk only about the Battle of Waterloo, but to talk about the campaign of 1815 in general, which is rather a short campaign, but still, because if you want to appreciate the, uh, the Dutch role, um, it's also very important to look at the previous battle, the Battle of Quatre Bras, uh, which took place um, on uh, June the uh, 16th, so two days before the climactic battle of uh, Waterloo itself. Um, now here's a map again, basically showing you uh, how uh, the three armies altogether uh, maneuvered uh, at the beginning of the campaign. Uh, again, uh, everything is in Dutch, but I think you can uh, basically read it. Uh, uh, in blue, you see the very concentrated, the, uh, the French army uh, taking the initiative. Uh, in green, you see the Prussian army and in red, you see the uh, Anglo-Dutch army. Uh, so that, that's still a large part of the map, simply because the Anglo-Dutch forces were rather late in concentrating their forces. So they were still pretty much spread out. I'll say something about that in just a minute. But let's first look at this very concentrated blue French army uh, that had um, penetrated uh, the kingdom. Uh, uh, crossed the border and also crossed an important river, the Sambre River, uh, near the town of Charleroi. And uh, it was definitely uh, Napoleon's intent to, and you already see this happening here, to drive a wedge between the Prussian army on the one side and the Anglo-Dutch army on the other side and hoping 
to, from a central position, to first defeat the uh, Prussian army, and after that job had been done to defeat the um, the Anglo-Dutch army, if that army under the command of Wellington had not already started to retreat to the uh, relatively uh, uh, safe uh, harbour ports of Antwerp and uh, Ostend. Um, this all happened on the uh, on June the uh, the fifteenth, which is the first day of the uh, of the campaign. Um, now, of course, uh, through intelligence and through uh, a reconnaissance, uh, it became quite clear that the French had started their attack. Uh, but Wellington wasn't very sure whether the attack here at uh, uh, Chalawa was going to be Napoleon's uh, uh, main effort. As a matter of fact, he was very much afraid that this was just going to be uh, a diversionary attack and that uh, what Napoleon was actually trying to do was to lure the uh, um, Anglo-Dutch forces more to the east and after that had been done uh, then Napoleon would uh, strike uh, against uh, Napoleon uh, against Wellington's right flank trying to sever uh, particularly his lines of communication his lines of retreat uh, towards Antwerp and uh, Ostend. So that's why Wellington uh, on the 15th decided to wait and say, okay, I'm not going to concentrate my uh, forces and move them uh, eastward because I don't want to fall uh, into Napoleon's trap. Um, now, uh, the Dutch uh, army was basically uh, uh, located um, uh, to the most eastern part of the Anglo-Dutch forces, so also near the uh, very important uh, um, crossroads uh, called Quatre Bras, which basically means uh, four arms, as as a crossroads uh, could be uh, uh, seen, and uh, that particularly the road going from west to east, east to west was particularly important because that was the main, that's a connection between the Prussians and the Anglo-Dutch uh, forces. And uh, contrary to um, uh, Wellington's orders, uh, the Dutch generals in place decided uh, not to give up Quatre Bras, uh, but to try to defend it at uh, all possible costs, and also to start to actually send reinforcements to Quatre Bras. So uh, it was a basically a Dutch decision to, um, to first of all, see the importance of Quatre Bras, and also to say, okay, we have to defend this. Otherwise, uh, the connection, the communication, if you like, between the Prussians and the um, and, and the Anglo-Dutch forces will be uh, uh, broken uh, very early on in the in the campaign, uh, which would be a, a major uh, major uh, result uh, for for Napoleon. Uh, so what we see in on the night of the fifteenth, and but also still in the early morning of the sixteenth, is. Dutch troops strengthening their positions around Quatre Bras. Uh, it's, let's say, we don't exactly can pinpoint to an hour, but let's say early in the morning, on the 16th of June, Wellington starts to realize that he, he was wrong, basically, and that indeed um, Napoleon's main effort was near Charlois and there was not going to be any outflanking or whatever uh, uh, other maneuver and then he starts to give orders for his own troops for the British troops also to uh, to move to uh, Quatre Bras the troops it's 1815 you know they all have to walk uh, so that takes time and he basically has lost a lot of precious hours by giving these uh, commands so late but he was, in a sense, very fortunate that his Dutch, uh, uh, Dutch commander serving under him had basically neglected his orders and had already started to uh, reinforce the position at Quatre Bras. Now, what happens on the 16th of June is basically two battles. Uh, it's the major battle 
takes place at the town Ligny, uh, where the bulk of the French army uh, fights uh, a long battle against the Prussian army in which the French are more or less victorious. Uh, they defeat the Prussians. Uh, so that's, you could say, one nail for uh, Napoleon. And there's at the same time takes place the battle at Quatre Bras, uh, which is uh, basically fought on the French side by its uh, the left wing of the French army under uh, command of Marshal Ney. And uh, for many hours, uh, the uh, the battle basically starts uh, around the afternoon, around uh, uh, 12 in the afternoon. And uh, the first hours of the battle is basically a Dutch, uh, relatively weak Dutch force that is fighting. It's a very tenacious, delaying battle in the end, denying uh, the French uh, army uh, the uh, conquering the uh, the crossroads, conquering Quatre Bras. And what you see happening later in the afternoon is that then the British reinforcements start to arrive. Wellington himself arrives on the scene and then uh, Wellington takes over, the Brits take over and they in the, indeed, in the end, uh, succeed in uh, defending uh, Quatre Bras and denying um, uh, the French their second victory on that uh, on that particular day. And uh, so if you talk about the Dutch, you know, the Dutch are very proud of their victory of uh, of Quatre Bras and Wellington has always been you know rather silent on this uh, on this particular issue um, here for instance you see one of the paintings uh, in which you see the Prince of Orange uh, personally leading a charge uh, near a farm at Quatre Bras and uh, very heroic of course you know the, the light is just shining on him uh, what a coincidence. Mm -hmm. And uh, leading his forces uh, against uh, one of the many uh, uh, French attacks on, uh, on Quatre Bras. Uh, so this is uh, very much the, uh, the Dutch uh, perspective. Uh, now this is basically what happens on the 17th. The 17th of June is a very interesting day because it's, you could say, it's a day uh, of, of non-battle because there was no battle on that particular day and uh but you could actually say that the 17th was the most decisive day of this very short campaign uh now why is that well the map already uh, tells you this a little bit um what happened uh after the battle of Ligny, uh prussians had been defeated is that uh, Napoleon gave his uh, uh, right flank, which is uh, numbers three and four on the map, uh, the assignment to chase um, uh, the Prussian army. Uh, well, the, the Prussian army had more or less disappeared into the night, so they had no clue as to where the Prussian army actually was. And, uh, well, the logical uh, uh, thing to... Uh, to imagine was that this army would have retreated eastward uh, along its lines of communication to the relative safety of let's say the fortress towns on the Maas River which would have been the most cautious thing to do uh, but the Prussians did not do that they made a different decision a, a, a much bolder decision in a sense because they said, okay, we're not going to retreat um, eastward, we're going to retreat more to the north. And uh, basically, this was a decision made by uh, Blücher's uh, chief of staff, uh, the very famous general Gneisenau. Uh, Blücher was, in, in, um, was missing for a while. He had been, uh, he was under his horse uh, and, and as, as a result of the battle. So it was Gneisenau who basically took over and said, okay, we're gonna move more to the north because I want to stay in touch with Wellington's army. Um, so what happens is that um, part of the French army starts to move eastward and basically outmaneuvers itself. Uh, and does not play a role anymore uh, during the Battle of Waterloo, simply because it's too far away. And uh, of course, this severely weakened uh, the French forces. And, and on the other side, 
the Prussians were still um, close to Wellington being able to come to the aid of the Anglo-Dutch forces, which, as you know, in the end also happened and contributed, let me put it in somewhat neutral terms, contributed to uh, the eventual uh, victory of the uh, coalition forces. Um, now here you see uh, the Battle of Waterloo, uh, a, a beautiful Dutch uh, 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 map, the two, let's say, starting positions. Uh, what is it, 80,000 uh, uh, troops uh, on, on both sides on a very small uh, 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 piece of territory uh, with important uh, um, positions like the uh, Hougamont farm, uh, La Ascent, another farm. And um, interesting, if you, if you now ask, okay, you know, we basically know the, um, the, how, the, how the battle uh, uh, took place. What was exactly the Dutch role? Well, uh, then we have to take into account that what one of very important decision by Wellington was to kind of divide the Dutch army, the Dutch troops, uh, into small parts, uh, brigades basically, and they were uh, positioned in between, let's say, the British, British German forces. Uh, from uh, the uh, positions near Hougoumont all the way to the most uh, uh, eastern positions near, for instance, uh, 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 Papalot and, uh, and Smohan. Uh, so the, if you say, if you ask me where are Dutch troops, well, there are, oops, uh, no, sorry, uh, they are all over. Um, by the way, if you talk about Dutch troops, uh, I talked about conscripts and about professional soldiers, the volunteers. There were also, let's say, German mercenaries within the Dutch army itself, particularly from the principality of, uh, of Nassau. And uh, the Nassau troops, for instance, played an important role uh, defending the farm of uh, Hougoumont, which is also not very prominent in, in British literature on the defense of, uh, of Ogumont. Uh, I'm not going to talk too extensively about the battle itself. Uh, let me just uh, mention a few words, uh, again, uh, highlighting uh, the Dutch uh, contribution. Uh, there was one rather negative story about the uh, the Dutch role at uh, Waterloo, having to do with uh, one brigade, a brigade that was uh, positioned, um, almost, let's say, over here, and it was called the Brigade uh, Bijland, and uh, that brigade was. Um, uh, played a role during the, the first large infantry attacks, which basically was the beginning of the, uh, of the, the French uh, attack after the initial preliminary artillery bombardments. And that brigade, which had been uh, rather weakened uh, because it paid a heavy price at Quatre Bras two days previously, started to retreat, more or less creating a hole in the um, in the Anglo uh, Dutch defense line and uh, a hole that could only be uh, uh, plugged in again uh, at um, uh, rather uh, was rather a narrow escape. Let me put it this way. So uh, that brigade has had a lot of negative press, if you like, uh, particularly in British literature on the battle. Um, um, but there are also positive, positive things to say about the Dutch contribution. Uh, particularly, I would like to stress the, the role that uh, Dutch infantry and Dutch artillery, particularly horse artillery, have played uh, in the final uh, uh, episodes of the battle when, um, rather desperate already, um, the uh, French Imperial Guard attacks and tries to um, um, destroy the uh, weakened uh, uh, British uh, Dutch lines. And then Dutch forces come up, uh, uh, particularly those that have been in reserve uh, for a long time, and they eventually succeed in driving back 
the uh, French Imperial Guard. Uh, and then, as you know, it's basically the end of the uh, of the French position. Uh, la, la, uh, when the it, it also becomes clear that the Imperial Guard starts to retreat and starts to um, uh, fall apart. Basically, it's the end of the. Uh, of the French uh, resistance, although uh, uh, thanks to the uh, the pressure that the Prussians have uh, put on the uh, on the French, uh, and uh, here, for instance, you see a painting, uh, which is a for Dutch military historians, or rather a, a well-known painting, uh, also by a very well-known uh, uh, painter who is uh, the let's say the. Um, the foremost Dutch painter of military genre pieces. His name is uh, Hoink van Papendrecht. Quite a difficult name to uh, to uh, to pronounce. And here you see Dutch horse artillery uh, bringing their um, six pounders into position to uh, to fire at the uh, the poor French infantry, the Imperial Guard that is approaching the lines in the in the. Uh, in the background, you can see the farm of uh, La Jacente. Uh, actually, this painter, Hoink van Papendrecht, uh, spent a lot of time on the, uh, on the battlefield. He lived at the end of the 19th century. He lived in, uh, in Waterloo for a while and made many, many uh, sketches of the, uh, of the battlefield that was still is quite well preserved. And he uh, try to uh, paint his scenes as uh, realistically as possible, but the rare in a sense also, of course, uh, from the Dutch perspective, also rather uh, uh, patriotic uh, in, that, uh, in that sense. Also, always as a counterbalance against, of course, the British story of, uh, of Waterloo, because many Dutch people, uh, particularly uh, officers, and people related to uh, to the military really wanted to uh, bring uh, the Dutch view and the Dutch co contribution to uh, to uh, to our attention. Um, now, funnily enough, you could say that the Dutch also uh, did themselves a disservice because this is the most famous painting on the Bat Battle of Waterloo in, in the Netherlands. It's, it's a huge painting. It's in the Rijksmuseum right now. Uh, so whenever you're in Amsterdam, you can again visit the museum. Uh, please have a look at this painting as well. Uh, it's by a Dutch painter, Pieneman, who was a very commercial, success, commercially successful painter, also working for the British market. And actually, this painting was commissioned by uh, the Duke of Wellington. Uh, and Pieneman very much hoped to be able to sell it to, uh, to Wellington. So he put uh, Wellington here uh, a center stage, you know, Wellington as the most important uh, figure, uh, no doubt. Uh, so in that sense, the, the Dutch themselves, or at least the Dutch painter, and it's now in the Rijksmuseum, can contribute to saying, okay, you know, primarily we're dealing here with a British victory. Now, where's the Prince of Orange? Well, the Prince of Orange is in the, uh, the left, uh, uh, lower left corner here on an improvised uh, stretcher, because during the battle, uh, he was wounded by a, a bullet from a musket in his uh, in his shoulder and so there was about seven o'clock uh, in the evening so when the battle was already was almost won already uh, he had to be taken away and and, and taken care of uh, which kind of added to his uh, um, status of a hero in the Netherlands because you know he had not only fought at Waterloo, but he has also shed his own blood for what was, you know, seen as the freedom of uh, of the country, freedom of the uh, of the Netherlands. So uh, he was uh, he was our Dutch hero of uh, of Waterloo. Um, now again, you know, um, uh, the Dutch have always tried to bring their version of the campaign of 1815 to, uh, to a larger audience. And um, just to give you one example, um, in the 1840s, uh, a Dutch officer, uh, also an amateur historian, uh, Willem Jan Knoop, he uh, basically took up the gauntlet because 
um, in in Britain, the, uh, the the most important historian on Waterloo was William Seaborn. He wrote uh, uh, a, a very important account of the battle. Uh, he also basically, you know, built the whole battlefield uh, as a model that you can still visit in the British Army Museum. And his account of uh, the Battle of Waterloo is, you know, to some extent rather chauvinistic, uh, stressing the importance of the British contribution and basically downplaying the role of the coalition forces and also the role of the Dutch. And he's also rather, you know, negative about the Dutch saying, you know, they were amateur forces and the Prince of Orange only uh, made matters worse, etc., etc. And then, uh, as a response, William, William Jan Knoop wrote, first of all, a brochure in which he, you know, attacked uh, 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 Seaborn. And it, and it led to a very interesting uh, a polemic. Um, although um, Knoop first wrote his brochure in Dutch, so that was good for the domestic market, and everybody was happy with him, and Knoop was a national hero because nobody reads Dutch. Uh, uh, in England. So it was translated into French. So that gave Knoop more or less also a European uh, uh, stage. Uh, there was also an idea to uh, translate it into English, but the English translator uh, didn't dare to do this because he was afraid that he might be sued by the British or that it might actually lead to a duel. Uh, so he backtracked and say I'm not going to uh, deliver. So it was just this French uh, translation uh, of the work by Knoop. And Knoop is, you know, the most important military historian of the 19th century and very Dutch nationalistic saying, you know, without Quatre Bras, without the Dutch victory at Quatre Bras, there would have been no Waterloo, there would have been no statue for Wellington. So Wellington should be a little bit more grateful. Now that's his opinion. Uh, nowadays, of course, we were not as keen uh, as 19th century historians were to, um, to choose this rather small uh, um, nationalist uh, perspective it's it's much more uh, <clears throat> interesting to to see it from a coalition and from a multi uh, dimension multinational uh, perspective um, well just to close off with this uh, uh, a nice picture of Waterloo and the lion monument which is built by the Dutch it has the lion is the symbol of uh, of the kingdom of the Netherlands the lion is of course facing southwards you know because the lion is there to protect us against further french aggression um, not realizing that uh, later on of course in history the aggression would no longer come from the south but it would come from the east uh, but that being a completely different story so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, there's much more to say about the Dutch. There's much more to say about Quatre Bras and Waterloo. Uh, but I'm going to leave it uh, with that for now. Uh, thank you again for your attention and uh, hope to talk to you uh, in another setting uh, in, not, in a not too distant future. Thank you.